I've been on a series um, of episodes teaching on the calling of God and the minister of the last days. Uh, we looked at um, the preparation of that minister in the last episode, and here I'm going to look at the rewards of eternity. All of these are designed to prepare and position you to do ministry and to do it accurately. And I believe that um, at the end of these episodes, um, your heart your heart to be taught so deeply to want to serve God with all that is within you and, of course, to do it with the highest level of accuracy that grace can afford you. Um, so in this episode, I'll be looking at the reward of eternity. And um, I just want to begin as a way of introduction to let us know that everything we do on earth um, we shall be recompensed for it. When we are dealing with rewards in eternity, uh, we are also looking at judgment in eternity. But there are two dimensions to judgment. There is judgment unto condemnation and there is judgment unto rewards. Um, Revelations chapter 20 uh, from verse 11 to verse 15, we saw the total compendium of judgment. In verse 12, we saw that the books of works was opened and people were rewarded according to their works. And in verse 15, we saw that the book of life was opened and people were rewarded based on their name being in the book of life. And um, I told us in the last um, episode that um, for those of us who are saved, there is a guarantee of our name being in the book of life. Because First John chapter 5, verse 11 to 13, the Bible says this is the record. It said God has given us eternal life. So the record of life is for those of us that our names are guaranteed to be in that book. So our names will be in the book of life. He said, whoever has the Son has life. And he said, these things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So we know that we have eternal life. We know that our names will be in the book of life. But there is also the judgment unto rewards where um, Jesus would judge all of us and apportion to us according to our works, especially those of us who are functioning as ministers of God. In Second Corinthians 5 verse 10, he said, we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in this body according to what he had done, whether it be bad, good or bad. So there is going to be a reward system for us. And it's on that note that I want to draw our attention as it's going to bring us a certain level of urgency to do what we do with all our hearts and also to strive to do it with accuracy. In Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10, the Bible speaking, and it said, for God is not unrighteous to forget our works and labor of love, which we, we have showed towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. So everything we do on earth, there's a reward at the end of time. In fact, First Corinthians 4, verse 5, the Bible makes it clear. It said, Therefore judge nothing before its time, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. He said, Then shall every man have praise of God. So there is going to be a reward, but there are bases for it. And that's why the Bible says not to be quick to, um, to you know, evaluate yourself. However, scriptures makes us, you know, understand some of the criteria that God considers, you know, before giving rewards to his people. And it's important for us to pay attention to these things because we don't want to be ashamed when Jesus appears. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 28, this is what the Bible says. And now little children abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him in his coming. So we don't want to be ashamed when he comes. That's why we want to evaluate these things so that we reposition our lives correctly, all right? So let's look at um, the reward systems of um, eternity. And there are two uh, dimensions to this teaching. The first, I'm going to show us the basis for reward. And then secondly, I'll show us the kinds of reward that we are going to be receiving in eternity. I say this with all humility, um, not as an authority as it were, but these are some of the contemplations I've had with the Lord and the revelations he's given me from the scripture. So now let's look at basis for rewards. The first basis for reward is our heart posture and our motives. Everything we do, the heart with which we do it and the motive that powers it is the first thing God considers. And if our motives are wrong, if our heart posture is wrong, we may not receive any reward for all of that action, no matter how beautiful they may be. In Jeremiah 17 verse 10, it says, I the Lord, I try the heart, I search the reins, to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doing. So God is more interested in the heart and the motive before he is interested in what we do. And that's why 1 Corinthians 4, 5, that we quoted a moment ago, says that judge nothing before his time. He said, when the Lord appears, he shall check the counsels of the heart. Then every man shall have praise of God. So if you want to have reward in eternity, you must be careful to have a pure motive and the right heart posture before 
you carry out any action, no matter how spiritual it is. The second basis for reward is ability to go through persecution. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 to 12, and Luke chapter 6, verse 22 to 23. Persecution is one thing that attracts great reward for, 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 for everyone who serves God. And this is why we don't, we, we don't cover from trials, persecutions, and tribulations because we know it holds for us great reward in eternity. The third basis for reward are righteous works. And righteous works, I mean self-denial, refusal to compromise, and everything we do that carries the character and the validation of the word of God. These things have reward. Hebrews 6.10, we already quoted that. So everything we do in law is a righteous work. Revelations 22 verse 12, Every work that we righteous work we do, there's a reward for it. First Corinthians three fourteen and Colossians three twenty three and twenty four. This is why we must be careful when we serve God to make sure we do it with purity, to make sure we do it for the right cause. Because if our works are not righteous, they'll be burnt. But if they are righteous, they are going to generate rewards for us. Number three, acts of kindness. Luke fourteen verse twelve to fourteen. Every act of kindness in this kingdom provokes reward. He said, Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friend nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen nor the rich neighbor, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense is made thee. Verse 13, he said, But when you make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. So Matthew 6 verse 1, 2 and verse 4. Jesus is telling us, primarily speaking here, that every act of kindness produces reward. And he said we shouldn't do it for human validation or approval. Rather, we should do it expecting that the Father will reward us. And of course, you need to understand that there is a place where, you know, you are partners and sponsors who you have to be accountable to. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking about making a show of acts of kindness. He said, don't do that because there is a reward attributed or allocated to every act of kindness. Number five, labor of intimacy. Every labor that we carry out to build intimacy with God, there's also a reward for it. Matthew chapter six, verse five and six. He said, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. He said, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogue and in corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. He said, verily I say unto you, they have their reward. He said, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, he said, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. So Jesus is telling us that all our engagements of intimacy produces reward as far as God is concerned. So prayer not only generates answer, yes, they also produce reward. So every act of intimacy has a reward allocated as far as eternity is concerned. And then so winning, so winning also comes with reward. John chapter 4, verse 36. It says, And he that reapeth, receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. First Corinthians 3, verse 8, Paul was speaking. He said, Now he, he that planted, and he that watereth, and one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So the labor of soul winning also produces reward. A Christian cannot be without soul winning. You can't be buried. Jesus said, If I brand thy some fruit, we say you'll be cut off and burnt. He said, But any brand that is fruit to God will prune, so that it bears more fruit. For therein is the Father glorified. John 15, verse 8. So if you don't produce fruits, you don't glorify the Father. You are useless to God's agenda. And there will be no reward for you. So, acts of soul winning also produce reward. So, these are seven basic Christian practices that comes with heavy rewards in eternity. Every practice that sustains right heart posture or right motive, every practice that makes you endure persecution, every practice that provokes righteous deeds, every practice that provokes acts of kindness, every practice that provokes labors of intimacy with God, Every practice that provokes soul winning has a tendency of reward. And if I may add, also your calling and ordination. There is a reward attached specifically to our callings and our ordination. Revelation 11 verse 18. You say, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and, thy, and the time of the death that they should be judged. And thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great and should destroy them, we destroy the earth. So everybody who has a calling on his life, there's a reward for your calling. You remember Paul was speaking in 2 Timothy 4, 7 to 8. He said, I have fought a good fight. 
I've kept the faith. He said, I've finished my course. There remained for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge shall give to me. So don't take your calling for granted. There is a reward for your calling. Now that I've shown you eight basis for reward, let me give you some specific rewards that the Bible itemized in the scriptures for those of us who shall labor on earth faithfully on the basis of, of reward that we've seen because there are rewards attributed to us. The first reward I'll pick out for us in this episode is what I call glory and light. See, the measure of glory that our lives will command in eternity will not be the same. Make no mistakes about it. For all of us who is saved, will be clothed with the robe of righteousness. But the glory that our robes carry is tied to the quality of works that we do. And I show you, Revelation 3, verse 5, it says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed with white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before the Father and before his holy angels. So all of us who are born of God, he said, whoever is born of God overcometh the world, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So all of us who are born of God, who are overcomers, who walk through this life in righteousness, holiness, and kept, you know, the basis of our salvation. We are going to be clothed with, with white robes. But you see, that's not all about the robes. The robes will carry glory in different propensity. And it is your labor that will determine how much of that glory you will carry. And I show you a few of them very quickly. Daniel chapter 12 verse 3. It's a day that shall be wise, shall shine like the brightness of the heavens. It's a day that turn many to righteousness like the stars forever. So the degree of your shining is a function of your labor of soul winning. And that's why I showed you already that soul winning is the basis for reward. And you may not know what glory really means because we are not yet in the celestial dimension. If you get to eternity, you are going to understand the significance of glory. And that's why God will give us measures of glory to the degree to which we fight for it. Now, Romans chapter 8 verse 17, Paul was speaking. And he told us, if we are children, we are heirs. If we are heirs, then we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. He now added something. If so be that we suffer with him, that we might be glorified together with him. So it's the one who suffers with him, who endures persecutions with him, that we be glorified with him. So the level of glory you enjoy in eternity is dependent on the degree to which you win souls, the degree to which you endure trials, and of course, the degree to which you labor with God in intimacy, because intimacy provokes glory. Even in this world, you begin to see it happen. In 2 Corinthians 5 from verse 1 to 3, Paul speaks about being clothed with our heavenly tabernacle, which is a function of our groaning in the spirit. So a man who doesn't have labor of intimacy, who doesn't win souls, who doesn't endure persecution, every little persecution he compromises, should not expect to have so much glory in eternity. Our glory will vary depending on the degree to which we work for it. Number two reward in eternity is the kind of name the authority that your name will command. You know, even on earth, our names don't bear the same authority. And the same will apply in heaven because the name we carry will be a function of a few things that we do while we are on earth. Revelation chapter 2 verse 17. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving him that receives it. There is a new name that will be given to every one of us. We are not all going to possess the same name. The kind of name and the kind of authority your name commands. See, okay, look at the angels, for example. Even the angels have different names. You have Gabriel, you have Michael, and all of these angels command different dimensions of authority because names matter in eternity. And Jesus is saying names are a function of those who overcome. But the question is, how do you trade on earth in order for your name to matter in eternity, the Bible gave us glimpses here and there in scriptures. We see that your ordination, what you do with your ordination, is what will determine the kind of name you bear. For example, Genesis 17 verse 5, God changed the name of Abraham to Abraham. John 1 42, Jesus changed the name of Simon to Cephas. Acts 13 verse 9, the name of Saul was changed to Paul. Mark 3 17, the guys were nicknamed by Jesus sons of thunder. That means your ordination has an impact on your name. So every calling that is on your life, the way you give expression to that calling will impact on your name. Look at some of our fathers of faith today. 30 years ago, you called their names, it meant nothing. But they have made full proof of their ministry. Today, their names command certain dimensions of authority. That is what God will also consider in eternity. What you do with your calling and who you become. Look at men in scripture like Abraham. Even in the world to come, the Bible says, Abraham shall sit and men shall come from the north and the south to salute him in the world to come. 
because he has kept the demands of his ordination. He has kept the demands of his calling. This is why you cannot trivialize the calling God has given to you because it's going to have an impact on you. Whether you overcome in keeping your calling, whether you overcome in keeping the demands of God as touching what he has committed to you will affect you in eternity. So those who treat their callings with levity, there are some people, they are prophets, and they think the whole thing about the prophetic is to go give people words of knowledge and collect money and go away. Some are music ministers. They think all there is about music ministry is you invite them, they charge you a social amount of money, they come and sing. They even call themselves artists now. Because we are not thinking eternity. We don't know that our callings does not end in time. Our callings proceed with us to eternity. In Revelation chapter 19, I think verse 10 now, the being that carried John and toured him through heaven, he wanted to worship him. And he said, no, don't worship me. And one of thy fellow servants, and of thy brethren. I am one of thy brethren. That means the guy was telling John, I'm one of you. But I've crossed over to eternity, still carrying out my ordination. Look at Moses and Elijah at the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, verse 2 and 3. They came. He said, this is Moses and Elijah. So their name went with them to eternity. So they became something. There's something that was added to that name. Even Jesus, after he finished his assignment in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, he said, God gave him a name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus is the Lord. So it wasn't the nomenclature per se that was changed. It's the authority that was changed. Lordship was added to the name. At the name of Jesus, same name that was given for salvation. But now Lordship has been added. So if you fulfill your calling, fulfill your ordination, you don't compromise. When you get to eternity, there are certain rewards that will be attributed to you based on the degree to which you fulfill your calling. And one of the expression of that is that there will be an authority credited on your name. Number three is Revelations chapter two. Also in verse 17, there is a reward called the hidden manna. There are those who will eat of the hidden manna. There are those who have access to the hidden manna. So there are privileged resources of eternity that God gives to certain people, but they must be overcomers. If you don't, you can never be given that access. And when I searched the scripture, I discovered that those who God gives this level of access are those who keep his commandments. Revelations 22 verse 14. Hear what the Bible says. Revelations. You know, some people take the instructions of God for granted. They don't know there's a reward to the degree that you obey, tremble, reverence and obey the instructions of God. He said, blessed are they that do his commandment, that they may have the right. Are you seeing this? So there is a right given to those who keep his commandment. They will have the right to the tree of life and enter through the gate into the city of God. So the hidden manna is a reward. The tree of life. Some people will not have the right to enter. He says it's those who keep his commandment. So God speaks to you. You take it for granted. You see some Christians, you see even ministers say, God told me not to do this, but my brother is not easy. Uh, we are trying. You are joking. You are denying yourself of certain privileges in eternity. There are certain resources of eternity that you will not have access to. And only God knows the significance of these things when we eventually get to eternity. Everything God tells you, guard it with your life. Everything he shows you from the scripture, give your all to it. It may become a basis for you to receive certain resources in eternity. In Revelation 2.17, he calls it the hidden manna. In Revelation 22.14, he calls it right to the tree of life. Only God knows how many other things that we have rights to if we will keep his commandment. Then number four is the crown of life. The crown of life is not for everybody. The crown of life is for those who endure trials and persecution. Revelation 2.10, it says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. He said, Be thou faithful unto death, and we give you the crown of life. It's those who are faithful in trials and persecution, even death, if need be, that qualify to receive the crown. So crowns in eternity are for those who endure trials. James chapter 1 verse 12, the apostle James reiterated the same thing. He said, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. He said, for when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life. So you see that there is something about enduring and overcoming trials that connects you to receiving crowns in eternity. So not every believer will have access to crown. It's the believer that endures trials that will have access to crowns. And if you study your Bible, you are going to discover that those who wear crowns in eternity, they are people who have the right to exercise authority, celestial authority. Revelation 6 verse 2. 
and I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. There's an authority you can't have in eternity except you have a crown. If you study Revelation chapter 4 from verse 1 to 4, those who sat in government, celestial government with God, the 20 and 4 elders, you know one of the things they had was crown. And now the Bible is showing us that people who go through trials qualify for crowns. These things are very important. Number one, I spoke of glory. And I told you to have access to great glory, you must be a soul winner. Because they that turn into righteousness shall shine like the stars forever. I said for have access to glory, you must go through persecution. Because they said, if we go through persecution with him, we shall inherit glory with him. Romans 8, 17. And then secondly, I spoke about the name. And I told you, for your name to have authority in eternity, you must make sure you pay heed to your calling and make full proof of your ministry. Because there is something about ordination and calling that we saw in scripture. Abraham changed to Abraham. Saw to, to Paul. Simon to Cephas or Peter. You see that? So you must be very careful to, to be consistent with your calling until you receive the, the reward of the authority that God gives to those who keep their calling. And then I spoke about the manner, the hidden manner, or the resources of eternity that is end. And I, I showed us from Revelation 22, 14 that it is those who keep his commandment that have the right to enter, to take of the tree of life. And of course, like we already said, the crown of life is for those who adopt the way of self-denial, trials, persecution for God without compromising, or even death. And then, of course, um, we have thrones. Thrones are also unique rewards in eternity. And again, thrones are for those who go through trials, tribulation, the chastening of the Lord, and persecution. If you are not able to endure that, you cannot inherit um, thrones. Um, Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 to 21. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Verse 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and I am set down with my father in his own throne. Luke chapter 22, verse 28 to 30. It said, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Verse 29, he said, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed unto me. Verse 30, he said, that ye may eat and drink in my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Thrones are for those who endure the chastening of the Lord or who undergo trials and refuse to compromise. The benefit of thrones is that like crowns, um, they give us enormous authority in eternity and or help us to you know bring us to that place where we literally become like a part and parcel of the government of the world to come you know co-inheriting with the father and living with him in that life as rulers forever and ever so it's important that we we we, we endure trials without compromising and it's important that we go through the chastening, in the process of the lord that builds us up because all of that is designed to qualify us for great reward. And then finally, his power to rule over the nations. Now, it's important for us to understand that the nations will be judged. And at the end of time, when the new Jerusalem appears, there will be the new earth as well as the new heaven. And in the new earth, there will be nations. And those nations will have governors. Those nations will have rulers. So they are men that God will give power over the nations. Look at Revelation 21 verse 1 and 2. I don't have time to go so deep into it. This is not eschatology, but just to show you a few things to stir your heart to serve God. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Are you seeing that? So there's a new earth. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Are you seeing that? So there will be the new earth. And that new earth, will have new, we have cities. Therein is the new Jerusalem. But the new Jerusalem is not the only city in the new earth. There will be other nations, and those nations will have governors. So those nations will be wielded to certain people in the world to come. That's not part of salvation package. That is part of service by grace, qualifying you for that reward. And so Revelation 22, verse 2, In the midst of the street, and either side of the river, was there a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded fruits every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There are nations in the world to come. The new earth will not have only Jerusalem as the only city. There will be nations. Those nations are the nations that God 
will hand over to some to rule over. Revelations 2 verse 26. It says, And he that overcometh and keep my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. So there are those who will give power over the nations. There will be governors. There will be rulers in the world to come over nations. And you saw that some of them, Jesus already disclosed it from this life. He said from the time of John, the kingdom of God suffered violence. That means that era has already been wielded to John. You see that? So you need to keep his works. This is why it's important. And he gave us the condition for becoming a ruler over nations. He said it is those who keep his works to the end. So the key to becoming a ruler over nations is faithfulness over divine entrustment. You see Luke chapter 19, verse 12 to verse 26. The Bible told us the parable of the talents. One was given five, one was given two, another was given one. The one that was given five doubled it. And the Bible said, the master said, I will give you ten cities. The one that was given two doubled it. The master said, I will give you four cities. The one that was given one did nothing about it. He went and hid it and the master called him a wicked servant. He said, if you had even put it in the bank, it would have generated interest. He said, now take from him that which he has. And he said, give it to the one who has more. And the people said, no, the one who has more already has so much. He said, him that has and desires to have more. He said, him that does not have and desires not to have, even the little he has will be taken from him and given to him that has and desires to have more. So those who will rule over nations are those who are faithful. Listen, God gives you a ministry of singing. You take it for granted. He gives you a ministry of intercession. You take it for granted. He gives you a ministry of soul winning. You take it for granted. At the end of time, whether you amount to becoming a ruler or a servant, that's your choice. Because in heaven, we are not going to be the same. Rewards we separate us into cadres. In salvation, we are all equal. Jesus paid the same price of his blood for all of us. But in the kingdom, we will be separated into cadres based on the rewards that we qualify for. This is why you must take ministry serious because this thing is not about being popular, it's not about being known, it's not about living the celebrity life. It's about living to please God. It's about living to advance God's kingdom and his agenda on the face of the earth. It's about knowing God more and becoming like God, all of which culminates to having a stake and a place with God in the world that is to come. It is my prayer that everyone listening to me today, the grace to make full proof of your ministry will be imparted unto you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Isaac, for this opportunity again. I'll see you in the next episode. God bless you.